talk about what I don't need from business architecture. And maybe what I do. Okay. So let's take a look at it. Back in 2002, the Open Group uh, members developed the vision and mission for the Open Group that was going to take us through the next stage of evolution. And of course, the headline term was boundless information flow, which of course many people still resonate with today. It's still something we're striving to achieve. And that vision was based on the fact that many of our members have been trying for some time, have been working hard for some time, to break down the barriers to effective communication and teamwork, cross-functional teamwork, within their organizations. With differing levels of success, obviously some commercial enterprises had done much better than some government organizations, but they'd all been working on it, and it was all a challenge. But they got to the stage where people were working together, and they now needed the information to be available, integrated, and made available to those entitled to it. But the problem they had was that all of that information was held in applications and systems that had been developed for those siloed or stovepiped divisions and departments within the organization. Shortly after that, I was able to attend a conference in New York with a number of really great speakers. So Rudy Giuliani, you know, how, how much better than that can you get? The former mayor of New York at the time of 9-11. The Right Honorable Madeleine Albright, very inspirational speaker, former Secretary of State of the United States. And Jack Welch, the former CEO of GE. Now, while he was at GE, Jack started the phrase, the boundless organization. And he had as much trouble saying it as many other people do. So after his talk, I was desperate to ask him what he felt about the value of boundless information flow. And the answer wasn't very nice. He was very abrupt. And he was somewhat frustrated. And he said, people always want more information. That's the problem. And he also said that the boundless organization is a way of thinking and acting within an organization. There's nothing technical about it. It's thinking and acting. Well, I have a lot of sympathy for the way that Jack was frustrated. You know, as a CEO, you have to make a lot of decisions based on incomplete information. And in a number of large organizations that I've worked with, there are managers who can't make a decision without more information. And the more you give them, the more they need, and they still can't act. But I also believe in the value of access to integrated information for those that are entitled to it. It actually enables cross-functional communication and teamwork. It actually helps people to act and think in a boundless way, which is what Jack was trying to achieve. Well, fast forward 10 years, and I'm having the same kind of reaction to business architecture that Jack had to boundless information flow. As far as I'm concerned, or I was concerned, business architecture is an outcome of the decisions that business leaders make. So why would I need BA? So this is my problem. The open group is a user of TOGAF. We are our own case study. I presented it a few years ago. I don't know if any of you remember it was called Drink Our Own Champagne. I thought drinking our own champagne sounded better than eating our own dog food. And we've gained a huge amount of benefit from that. Um, we've reduced our risk of the burning platform. We've improved our capabilities uh, that we can deliver. And we've improved the experience for our users. So after that, you know, I thought, well, to what extent did we use business architecture? Well, other than what's in phase B of the TOGAF ADM, we didn't. So in addition, I've studied the way that organizations have changed their business architecture. 
and what impact it's had. And, uh, you know, as one of our chairmen of the Open Group said to me once, I never knew before how many levers you have to pull to run an organization. Jack Welsh, going back to him, while he was at GE, he was known as Neutron Jack because he closed down so much of GE. But he grew it by acquisition. He also um, had a regime that the lowest 10% performers in all areas were let go each year. He had a huge impact on that organization and that architecture of the organization was defined by the decisions he made, not by any standards for business architecture. Then what about um, Fred Smith? How many people know Fred Smith? How many people know FedEx? You've heard of FedEx, okay. <laughs> so the story goes that while Fred was at, at Yale, studying at Yale, he wrote a paper about what was to become FedEx. It was marked as a fail. And the reason for that is that teachers of business only have current models to work on. How could they have understood such an industry-changing idea? How many times do we hear stories about what Apple have done here and there as an example of something? Or in the past, it was how Dell had changed the supply chain, or how other organizations have made significant progress. But how many times would the teachers of business have been, been able to predict the massive changes that Apple, Amazon, Google, and others have made to industries as a whole? They, they don't. They just tell you what other people have done. Closely aligned to FedEx is Dell. Um, I just mentioned them. They changed the way that the supply chain of PCs is delivered quite substantially, um, with FedEx doing the final assembly. It was a massive change and made them very competitive for a while. And then, of course, there's this guy, Richard Branson. His idea of running a business is, um, screw it, let's do it. So what impact do you think that has on the business architecture? So I've thought a lot about the way the Open Group business architecture has evolved and why I would need business architecture. The decision to adopt boundaryless information flow wasn't made based on any standards for business architecture, not knowingly anyway. It was made based on listening to our members and knowing what they wanted. The decision to start TOGAF was made the same way. In fact, the decision to start all of our forums, work groups, and consortia has been made in exactly the same way. The decision to start examinations for certifying people was not made based on any business architecture work. It was based on a gut feel that I had that it was a good idea at the time. And I was told that it would be a waste of money, so I threw the dice and got lucky. Okay. So the question in my mind Oh, and these, the examinations, by the way, led to a lot of implications for our business architecture, like how would we operate and develop them, what would we do in-house, what would we outsource. All of those decisions had to be made, but without any business architecture. <clears throat> so the question in my mind was, you know, what, what do I need from what is now business architecture? So before we went to our conference in Sydney, I contacted everyone that I could find in Australia and New Zealand that had the title of business architect. And I asked them, what, are, what is it that you do? Where do you fit in the organization? And at the same time, they also answered the question of, does business architecture apply to government or does it just apply to businesses? Right. So what they do Oh, those are two questions. What can business architecture do that we can't do without it? And isn't business architecture?
architecture, just a phase of enterprise architecture. Okay, so what they do, we've heard a lot about start with the why. Business architects don't need to do that. They focus on the what. So they focus on understanding the strategic themes and drivers, modeling the value chains, value streams, context modeling, capabilities, business capabilities, service capability, and so on. Calling out the interdependencies, design, and linking with and supporting the strategy, and having an impact on the investment planning cycle. Where they fit in the organization was interesting. Some are in the CIO function. Some are in the business lines. They all feel as, as though they are one of the three critical legs of enterprise architecture. The other two being business analysts and solution architects and the other architecture disciplines. The question of whether business architecture applies to government or not was beautifully answered by a business architect that works for one of the large government departments in Australia. Because when I asked the question, she was almost shocked and said, well, of course, we will have to report into the business lines at some stage. We do business architecture in this government. So it now comes down to what it means for the open group. The open group has two key products, essentially, um, membership and certification. So to, to give us some basis, some context for things, I thought I'd play around with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So many of you will be familiar with this, right? So starting at the base layer, all that people need to start with is food, water, warmth, and rest. And it's only when they've satisfied those needs that they would move up to personal safety and security. And then they would move up the stack through belongingness then esteem. And it's only the fortunate amongst us that can realize self-actualization. We actually see on the news quite regularly those people that will never reach that stage. Well, for the open group, I've put it a different way. At the base level, we need to make sure that we can sell membership, deliver membership, get paid for it, and especially profit, especially important for a not-for-profit organization, is don't lose money. Right? You may not be wanting to make money, but you definitely don't want to lose it. Once you've got that in place, then you have to worry about mitigating the risk. Of course, risk is an essential part of anything we do. Starting examinations was a risk. Protecting our assets is critical. We do that through trademark protection and worrying about how we protect copyright and so on, while at the same time being open relationships, ecosystem, and then at the very top is where we're hoping to be recognized like Nike or Apple or other top brands, but where customers are our advocates. Now that happens now. A lot of you advocate for others to join the open group or get involved with the open group or do something with TOGA or other of our standards. So people are advocating right now. So I'm not saying that we do all of this well, but we do do all of it. And what I need from business architecture, what I do need from business architecture, is to make us do this better. So let me look at brand actualization to start with. What we need is to be able to map every interaction that every representative from every member organization has as they move through that customer journey from being made aware of us to participating and then becoming advocates. If we can understand where they are at every point of that journey, we can deliver value to them at every point of that journey and not treat everyone as needing the same information at the same time. We can also understand more about the people so we can segment the information so that we don't treat people as one size fits all. There are some things that we cannot do anything about. If that exchange rate goes horribly wrong, we 
go from a small break even or a small profit surplus to a loss. Nothing we can do about that. And we can't plan for it. Business architecture will not get us out of that hole. If you look at other industries, just as a benchmark, the airline industry, 30% of their operating costs are oil. Right? So uh, you can see when um, in 2008 the impact that the oil price had. And you can imagine that they're all very happy right now. So it all depends on how you play the cards you're dealt. So we have a number of areas that we focus on. The customer journey is one that we're putting a lot of work in on today. So I need business architecture to help us with that. Capabilities, we've been working on capabilities for a while. And in a small organization, you kind of know where your gaps are, but it's much better if we can document them in a way that highlights them. And this is about value streams. Now, the reason that I have got this is a pencil drawing, even though Dave's mortified that I would show it, is that that was how it's, it was developed. And one of the things I learned when I was talking to the business architects in Australia and New Zealand was that very often the most useful tool they have is a pencil and paper. We also have a number of standards that we can fall back on. The world-class enterprise architecture, there's a URL up there, has a business reference model that keeps us guide, that guides us through this. Of course, for architecture, we have TOGAF and Archimate. And occasionally, I resort to the primitives of the Zachman framework. Um, we also have for risk management, we have the risk analysis, risk taxonomy, and all of the fair. We have a lot of other standards that we can look at. Not to mention the white papers, the guides, and most importantly, all of the case studies that are given at events like this. Now, I did say earlier that, no, rewind. So this is where I think business architecture is. It can provide us with a greater focus on the what. And if we do that, we can add a lot of value. Business architecture is a part of enterprise architecture. And so far, I haven't found any reason to think that we need to change the Zachman framework for it or to change uh, or to do anything other than to fill out phase B of TOGAF for it. It is applicable to the government as well as to the business of businesses, and as we use it in the open group, it's also applicable to the business of non-profit organizations. So yes, I did say that back in 2001, leading up to the adoption of the vision in 2002, we didn't knowingly use any standards for business architecture when developing the vision and mission of the open group that was going to take us forward. What we used to structure the discussions was the business scenario method that's been part of TOGAF since TOGAF 8. So in reality, we have been using business architecture all along. 